I'm uh, happy that everyone's back uh, here for the seminar, the IIES seminar series. Uh, we had a good talk last week. This week, we have Dr. Adrian Cashman uh, from Barbados. Just a brief background about Adrian. Uh, Adrian has over 40 years experience in the water sector. He's been working in the Caribbean based in Barbados for the last 15 years, first with the University of West Indies and now as an international water resource management consultant. He has worked on numerous research and consultancy projects across the Caribbean. Just furthermore, just some more information about, about Dr. Cashman, he has published works that cover a diverse range of fields, including critical accounting, geography, water, and climate change, water policy, resource management, and future studies. He has worked with a wide range of international and regional organizations on water and climate related matters, including, among others, the UK Department of Trade and Industry, the OECD, IDB, UN bodies, and the UK House of Lords. With that, uh, we thank you, Adrian, for joining us today. We look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks, Erin. And if you could just confirm that you can actually see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Great, then I'll get, then I'll get going. So um, good morning, everybody, uh, or good day to you if you're in other time zones. Uh, my challenge today is to share with you something a little bit about the management of water and wastewater in the, in the Caribbean. Um, I'm going to do, this is a brief outline of what I hope I'm going to be able to cover as we go through um, the next hour. I'm gonna first of all, talk a little bit about the governance arrangements that pertain in the Caribbean. Um, water resources, the current state, um, say a little bit about how water resources are managed, the provision of water and wastewater services, and to round off, um, share some thoughts about the challenges facing the Caribbean with respect to water, uh, water management. Um, my focus is going to be, I, I have to add this caveat, uh, focus is going to be mostly on the English speaking Caribbean. Um, for those of you who may not know, the Caribbean is actually a very diverse place because you have um, very briefly the English speaking Caribbean, the Spanish speaking Caribbean, um, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Cuba, and to a certain extent, Puerto Rico. You have French speaking Caribbean, which would include Haiti. Um, and then you have other, uh, other groupings as well, like the Dutch, uh, Dutch Antilles. Um, so the first, thing I want to share with you, talk a little bit about, is governance and governance matters. And the first question is, because we're talking about water management, let's be somewhat clear about what this all encompasses. So water management, uh, you can find many uh, descriptions of of what it might entail, but just uh, as a summary, it's the control of movement of water resources to minimize damage to life and property and to maximize the efficient beneficial use. So the idea that there is a resource out there that we are going to use, um, but we also recognize that that resource can cause damage. It can be um, part of natural disasters and that we, that in our managing of it, we're trying to minimize that. It also includes the planning, developing, distributing and optimum use of water resources. The management of water and wastewater services. So Whilst we can plan and develop we all, and distribute, we also have to manage the way in which we do that 
and that is the management and the operation of the services. We also do so within a framework that water is a scarce resource, finances are a scarce resource, that there can be different objectives, and so that we are guided in the way we manage water by the application, the development and application of water policies and the laws and regulations that are there to give effect to those policies. We can broaden it a little bit as well because most of that talks about the provision of a service, but we can also include in water management, management of drainage, stormwater, and flood protection. I would say that this part of it, this drainage and stormwater, has not really, in some ways, not really been at the forefront of our thinking when we've talked about water management in, in general. But with climate change, with some of the challenges that we are, will touch on later in this session, that the management of drainage and stormwater is actually becoming more important and it is increasingly being seen not, uh, in, increasingly seen, let me say, as a resource and not as something that is an irritant uh, at, at best to be, to be got rid of. And lastly, although water management tends in, certainly I've found, tends to focus on the provision of water services for domestic use, for residential use, commercial and industrial, we should not forget that it also, that agriculture and irrigated agriculture also makes use of water. Um, although the management of water resources for agriculture does tend to be dealt with somewhat separately from municipal water. But if we take a holistic look, we should be looking at water management. And I will talk about that in the next couple of slides. We need to take a more holistic look at the management of water and management of water services. So one of the things that, um, got, that has been developed to guide how we should manage water resources in an integrated way were the Dublin principles that were um, developed in 1992 as part of the uh, Rio, just as a precursor, in fact, to the Rio summit and were incorporated into the discussions of the Rio summit back in, as I say, 1992. And we use these four principles. Uh, we refer to them as our guiding principles um, against which we measure or benchmark how well we're doing in managing our water resources. And these things may seem obvious, but it's never, it, 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 it's never a bad idea not to state the obvious sometimes. <clears throat> so the first is water is a finite and vulnerable resource, as we know, essential to sustaining life, development, and the environment. If you look at, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, and ask yourself, can any one of those sustainable development goals be achieved without water playing a role in some way? I would suggest to you that you would ha have to answer no. Water is part, is an enabler in, in all of those, the achievement of all of those sustainable development goals. It is absolutely essential. 
to life development and the environment. And water is it's a finite resource. In other words, the water we have on the planet now is the same as it was a million years ago and is likely to be the same in a million years time. So we cannot create more water, it is finite. And that idea of it being finite does guide a lot of the way we think about and develop water. Water development and management should be based on a participatory approach involving users, planners, and policymakers at all levels. I'll talk a little bit about that. Women play a central role, part in the provision, management, and safeguarding of water. Again, we can touch on that. And water has an economic value in all its competing uses and should be recognized as an economic good. This in some ways goes back to water being finite. Economics is about how you allocate a scarce resource amongst competing usages. And so this principle reinforces that point. And so these principles inform our thinking and have become a touchstone in the Caribbean when we're talking about how we develop and manage our water resources. This all speaks to, to governance. I'm just not going to dwell a lot on, on this, but very often we come back to governance the way in which we manage our water resources as being absolutely essential. Water governance describes the political, economic, administrative, social processes and institutions by which public authorities, communities, and the private sector take decisions on how best to develop and manage resources. That sounds great, but a recent study by Global Water Partnership Caribbean carried out for the IW Eco project, which I will touch on this earlier this year, observed that policy and governance have remained unchanged for several decades, with many Caribbean states yet to adopt effective policies to address the challenges in water management. In other words, the way in which water is being governed being managed in the Caribbean is still making use of programs and policies that were developed 20, 30, 40 years ago. They have not evolved and in some cases have not um, tried to integrate those four principles, those four Dublin principles in the way that water is governed in the Caribbean. So just an example, few countries have any independent economic regulation of water services. In other words, few countries uh, look at whether, whether tariffs are appropriate and distance those decisions from politics, from the political direction. One of a couple of the few countries uh, that do have some independent economic regulation include Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago. Although even there, the minister has the final say on aspects such as water tariff increases. Few countries have legally separated water resources management from, from the provision of water services. And again, they include Jamaica, and St. Lucia. I say legally separated because I want to make the decision, the, the distinction between countries such as, for example, Trinidad and Tobago, which does have a separate water resources agency, but it is still legally part of the water service provider, although there are moves within the legislature to address that issue. There are I put no formal arrangements 
for participatory decision making. In other words, legally, water utilities and water authorities are not required, although they do do so, they're not required to involve stakeholders in decision making. And the use of management instruments such as formal planning requirements, permitting, and even going as far as things like payment for environmental services, these management instruments are not well developed. Now, <clears throat> that, um, that all sounds very daunting. Um, and, but what I would say is that these are problems that are not just um, peculiar to the Caribbean. I'm not going to go through all the issues that that report uh, and other reports have identified a number of issues um, that affect governance in, in the Caribbean. Um, things like, as I've touched on, inadequate legal and regulatory frameworks. Uh, you will have access to these slides so you can go through them at, at your leisure. Um, one of, that's on the positive side, though. The challenges are recognized, and there has been work over uh, the past few years to try and improve the situation. And in fact, there is there's a project looking at the development of a shared frame, integrated water resources framework for the whole CARICOM region, that hopefully, by creating a framework, by creating uh, this, this common approach that we should would be able to address at the national levels, provide an impetus at the national levels to try and address some of those challenges that I've touched on briefly. And this is for, um, resulting in something that has come out recently, a roadmap of actions for integrated water resources management in the Caribbean region, looking at how to bring about those changes between this year and by the year 2028, defining the strategic directions. So although we are aware of the challenges facing us, we have developed, as a region, we have developed a plan to try and address that. And that needs to filter down to the national level. So that's on the governance. I'm now going to turn to water resources and a little bit about water resources. So the Caribbean, it's a really big area. It's probably the same size as Australia, but whereas Australia is all land, most of the Caribbean is water. And one of the strange, the anomalies or, or, or twists that there is to the Caribbean is the countries that it includes. So for example, we can divide it into different regions, the Bahamas, the Greater Antilles, the Lesser Antilles, but we also include, depending, um, countries like Belize, Guyana, and Suriname, which are part of, you could say, the continental Americas, rather than the insular Americas. The islands themselves can be, they're very diverse. They, some are of coral origin, some are volcanic, some are mixed. And those differences in geography, geomorphology, influence water resources. So the geology influences the water resources, but the climate does as well. We're a tropical region. It is warm to hot most of the time, but we have distinct wet and dry seasons. The wet season generally, which we're in at the moment, generally coincides with the hurricane season. Temperatures are fairly constant throughout the year, but precipitation rainfall on an island there depends on local topography. And so we often see on the windward side of islands with mountains receive more rain than the leeward side. The other thing is because we, relatively small islands that the rain the rain that falls 
the distance between the highest point and the coastline are rather short. So we have very short accumulation times during rainfall events. So they tend to be very flashy. And there's also this seasonal variation in stream and river flows between the dry season and the wet season. So if you're reliant on surface water resources, then you are going to be affected by this seasonal variation. And looking at how those resources are utilized, um, countries that are utilizing predominantly surface water resources include Belize, 78% of their water utilized water resources comes from surface water. Um, going going through 83% Cuba, uh, Haiti 80%, Jamaica 63%. Other countries which tend to be more coralline, I would say, uh, although not exclusively, rely very much on groundwater. So Barbados, for example, relies for about 85% of its water is water from groundwater. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, which although not, not a coralline island, depends about 70%. Other countries where water resources, because of their size or, or for other reasons, um, may not have, be well endowed with water resources, uh, have come to rely on desalination. So Antigua, for example, relies 60%, 62% on desalination. And many other countries, Belize included, Barbados included, Trinidad included, also have um, desalination as part of their water resource, utilized water resources. Now, it might be thought that there isn't a water resource availability problem in the Caribbean. However, during the, during the dry season, there are countries that are unable to meet the demand for water because of the decreases in stream flows. And those countries include Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadine, well, St. Vincent, not the Grenadine, and St. Lucia. And there are parts of the Caribbean that rely on harvesting rainwater. These tend to be the smaller islands, often where there is, uh, in the terms of, in, in case of the Grenadines, where the um, government water utility has a much weaker, has a much weaker um, presence. Now I wanna put all this into some form of context. And I, what I want to do, and I've done so in this diagram, um, where what I've done is I've looked at, these are figures taken from uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization's Aquastat database. And here, what I've done is I've looked at the total annual renewable water resources per person, sometimes referred to as the Holkenmark Index, which is used very, very often. And I plotted that against water stress. Now that is the amount of water that is abstracted from water resources as a percentage of the total annual renewable water resources. So what we, and I then use the, the various uh, benchmarks. So looking at water stress, which is uh, referred to as part of SDG 6.4.2, uh, anything between 20 and 40% uh, utilization of uh, water resources is referred to as medium to high water stress. Anything between 40 and 80 is high and anything over 80, 80% is extremely high. Uh, in terms of water um, uh, renewable per capita, anything below 500 cubic meters per person per year, a country is said to be in absolute water scarcity. Now you can see from this, there is a very wide difference across the Caribbean. Barbados falls in that top left-hand corner, and I've contrasted it with the figures from 1999 to 2019 where they're available. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis also looks to be 
in a very precarious position. But many, many of the other countries, the ones on the bottom right-hand side are referring to Suriname, Guyana, and Belize. Most of the others are in that cluster there at the bottom. So really, <clears throat> for many of our islands, we're not in a position where water resources, the availability of water, should be a limiting factor. So that then um, <clears throat> brings me then, if water in terms of the resources at present is not a limiting factor for most countries, Barbados and St. Kitts and Nevis may be as exceptions, what is going on? Because water resources, it's the resource, but you have to you move the resource <clears throat> from where the resource is to where it needs to be used. And that is what water services do. So now I'm turning to water resources, water services. <clears throat> In terms of water supply services, most water utilities are government owned. Very few countries have private water companies. Jamaica, Turks and Caicos Islands are examples of that. And in many instances, only the national water utility can legally supply water to consumers. So for example, those that operate desalination plants, the usual arrangement is the desalination plant has to sell to the national water utility, which then distributes. The good news is that water supply coverage is very high with the exception of Haiti, and you can see that um, on the right-hand side there, the percentage of population with access to safe drinking water from across the Caribbean. Um, it's only in Dominican Republic where it drops below 90%, with Haiti being something of an outlier for um, reasons that we won't, um, you may be aware of, but we won't go into but most countries are above 90%. Most of the population has access to water. However, looking at how well those services operate, we see that from a 2021 study by the Inter-American Development Bank, the Caribbean Water Study, and there's the reference to it, the quality of services provided, such as continuity, quality of water supply is low. Profitability and financial capacity are low, and many of them do not have, operate at margins below what is required for financial sustainability. And most of them have scope to improve their operating efficiency. In other words, I would put it to you, that in most instances, we have the, the water resources that are available, taking into account seasonality, are sufficient. But the way in which we are able to mobilize and provide those resources to where they are needed is where things start to go wrong. The table there on the right-hand right side um, gives a bit of a snapshot of some of the water utilities that were surveyed in, in, that, re in that report. Um, if we look at some of the key challenges that have been identified uh, for facing water services, and this is drawn from a number of reports, it, uncertain financing remains one of the greatest challenges. Countries and utilities are highly indebted. In other words, they borrowed a lot, of, a lot and they're having to repay those debts. This limits your ability to access capital to address the, um, the capital work needed to maintain your water services. And compounding that is that the tariffs and revenues often do not, often only cover operational costs. So in other words, 
you're not able to start paying off the interest that there are on, on loans. In fact, in many cases, it's the government that takes on the loans rather than the utility. The big, the big issue is non-revenue water. And this comes up time and time again. And what is said is that non-revenue water high levels are symptomatic of poor financial planning, resource allocation. You're spending money to provide a service and you're spending more than you have to because you're losing water. And often water utilities are under-resourced to be able to address this. And this is becoming more and more of an issue. The other one is inadequate planning. Few countries have a water resource master plan uh, and then very few formal drivers requiring that require them. And what tends to happen is utilities are pushed to respond to poo to short-term programs and interventions. Um, the diagram on the right-hand side uh, shows the uh, coverage of um, the, the, the coverage of uh, uh, wastewater wastewater services there. Sorry, not wastewater services affordability this is affordability of water um, of water services so in the belize water services the one on the left hand side what is charged is three percent of a household budget whereas a guideline would be one percent of a household budget so in many cases from here onward that the tariffs and the cost of water is below what would normally be considered reasonable. Um, I'm not going to go through this one, but this is again a, an analysis of some of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats facing water, water services um, in the Caribbean. And it's taken from a publication of a couple of, a couple of years ago, but it still, I think, um, pretty much sums up where we are. I'm going to turn now to wastewater services, which is the corollary of water, of water supply. And a few points. Wastewater services are usually provided by the same utility that supplies the water. What is the difference? Well, water supply provides a productive service for which customers are usually willing to pay as they can derive a benefit from it. Wastewater is a service for something which customers do not perceive that they derive a benefit from. Hence, in comparison to water supply, it has a low willingness to pay. And this also translates into how do you charge for wastewater services? And often the way we charge for wastewater services is by adding on to our water supply. But this may not be an effective or efficient way of financing wastewater services. I'm not going to. If we look at the proportion of people using safely managed sanitation services in the Caribbean, if you look at the figures again from FAO Aquastat, uh, generally it's the coverage level is over. Is, over 90%, and it's only really Dominica and Haiti that have coverage levels of, of below 90%. That is uh, access to safely managed sanitation services, which would include things like septic tanks. However, the percentage of wastewater collected and treated, usually by a municipal, let's say a municipal system, is very low. And the diagram on the right hand side there shows some of the uh, coverage statistics of collected and treated wastewater. WASA, which is the um, Water and Sewage Authority in Trinidad and Tobago, 
has a coverage of about 30%. Jamaica, the NWC, 20%. Going down to the Barbados Water Authority, I've taken these figures from a somewhat old, older report, of only about 2%. It's probably more like between 2 and 3% of the population uh, um, is serviced by a municipal system that adequately treats and manages wastewater. Only 15% of wastewater, and this comes from the Crew Plus, the Crew Project, um, the Global Environmental Facility Crew Project, entering the Caribbean Sea is currently treated, and it poses threats to the marine ecosystem as well as to land terrestrial ecosystem. However, one thing I would say is that I think the attitude to wastewater is changing, and right? partly driven by climate change. It is a recognition that wastewater treatment does offer benefits, and more and more we are turning to look, looking at how we can incorporate, upgrade and incorporate wastewater services as one of the ways in which we can maximize our water resources more and, and use them more efficiently. And I would just mention that Barbados has just received a grant from the Green Climate Fund for upgrading its wastewater management precisely on the basis that this is a climate change adaptation. So wastewater management is a challenge for water utilities. Um, water utilities, I would say that in the past, they have not done a particularly good job of managing wastewater. And there are many reasons for that, and I don't have the time to, to get into them. Jamaica has tried to address this by developing a public-private partnership approach in Kingston with the Soapbury Works. Um, but the question is, how do you incentivize the provision of wastewater service? How do you encourage something that people um, in general uh, don't see the benefit from um, and therefore paying for, um, how do you in incentivize the uptake of wastewater and provision of waste? And one way I would suggest to you is through looking at the planning and regulatory controls. So those are something on water resources, water um, potable water services and wastewater services. I'm now gonna round off in the next five to 10 minutes with some of the challenges that um, we are looking at and needing to needing to address in there. So the first one which would probably pop into your mind is climate change. Climate change is certainly a, a, a challenge. And why, why is this? The way I would put it to you is that when we look at water the provision of water services, the provision of infrastructure. The provision of infrastructure you put in and you, it needs to provide a service over a very long period of time when there will be changes in circumstances, changes in population, changes in demand, changes in where people are living, changes in lifestyle. So the system and there will also we're putting on top of that now there's no climate change in the jargon there is no such thing as stationarity anymore in other words what we thought we had in the past in terms of water resources is not we can't assume that that is going to be the same going into the future so when we look at our systems and look at them to develop them to be adequate to meet demands for the next 50 or more years, we have to take into account all these, all this variation. So we need to look at climate change as well. So adaptation is needed both on the supply side and the demand side. Let me deal with the demand side. Demand is how much water we use. So it's a thing, it, this talks about behavior. So at the moment, let's say, uh, you might be using 230 liters per person per day um, in certain countries. That's an awful lot of water to be used. Other countries, 
may only be using 100 litres per person per day. We need to get down to the more efficient and effective consumption of water. In other words, not using more than we actually need to perform the, the, perform the duties, perform the uh, activities that they're required for. So that's on the demand side. And there's a whole load of things that we can, behavioral change, using economics to influence uh, people's um, attitudes. And on the supply side, are there ways in which we can maximize and the use, maximize our water, the use of our water resource? And um, that comes down to the challenge of trying to separate the effects of climate change from the failures in operation and maintenance, which compound the effects of climate change. Water quality could be adversely affected. Um, I know I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm not going to go too much into that. And one I would put to you is, how do we maintain environmental flows? Water in, in groundwater, in rivers, it, we cannot and should not use, think of that that is, we can use all of that. The environment on which we rely also is a consumer and a legitimate consumer of water. And we need to maintain environmental flows. We need to balance the demands of the environment, the needs of the environment with the needs of society. And that is something we're starting to grapple with, certainly in the face of climate change. And then the other question is, is desalination actually the answer to climate change? And I would put it to you that it is not. I was going to say something about some of the projects that are ongoing. I just picked a couple out that are trying to address climate change as an, as an issue, um, but we may be able to come back to that. It may be in some of the questions and answers. Extreme events is another challenge that we face. What I, I may be, my view on this is, is maybe counterintuitive, that for me, water systems of themselves are relatively robust. Their vulnerability, there are points of vulnerability, and the major point of vulnerability is that last point I mentioned, is energy system. Unless you're operating under gravity, you need electricity, you need power to provide your service. And that is the one of the vulnerabilities of water systems during extreme events. I'm not... Um, taking anything away from when we have landslides that rip out pipelines. Yes, that, those, are, um, those are issues that are associated with extreme events. But things like the reservoirs, um, if they're full, it's very difficult to shift a reservoir even under an extreme a hurricane event. But things that we can do is look at distributed systems so that if one part of our supply system goes down, that there, we have enough resilience and redundancy in it that we can shift water around. The other one is increased storage. And I think that certainly this is an issue, not only for extreme events, but also we need to look at this in the context of climate change, the seasonal vari variability. Increased storage, to my mind, is something that we need to look to, to consider. And we, it is starting, I, I will say that, it is being built in. And the way in which we optimize the resources that we use. More and more attention is being paid to things like aqua, managed aquifer recharge, conjunctive use of, of sources, in other words, combining groundwater and surface water. So when you have low surface water, low flows during the during the uh, dry season, you may use proportionately more from your groundwater and your, your, your water system is geared to um, accommodate that. The other one, um, that the, and, and the last one that I will put to you is, and I touched on it a little bit earlier on, is agriculture and food security. 
And certainly in the Caribbean, there is this push for food security that's been around for, for, for a, a few years. If we're going to push for greater food security, produce more of our food, and as leaders have said, they want to reduce the region's food import bill by at least 25% by 2025. That means bringing more land into production. We can bring more land into production, but is the rainfall, is the precipitation, the rainfall pattern that we have going to be sufficient to support that increase in production? Increasingly, we're looking at irrigation. Now, irrigation, as I said earlier on, is a competing need that we have to balance. And do we have the information, the tools to be able to make those decisions? Now, I've talked very much about this and the challenges. I haven't talked so much about the solutions and, the, and what is being done. What I would say is that we have been, we are aware of, of these challenges that we're facing. And there are, both at the regional level and at the national level, there are interventions, programs that are being put in place. There is cooperation and collaboration that is addressing these issues. Um, I haven't got into them. I perhaps should have done. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that we're just swamped. We are doing something about it. We are addressing these challenges, but it takes time, it takes money, and it takes expertise, all of which are scarce resources. And with that, I'm going to just finish off now and invite any questions, any comments, um, disagreements, uh, whatever, let's have a conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adrian, for an interesting talk. Um, are any questions from uh, participants online? Or you can put your questions in the chat box. Okay, Adrian, I, I have a quick question for you. You talked about uh, non-revenue water. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a big problem. And any, anyone who's producing drinking water is a major issue. Yep. Across the various islands, what is the, um, like a percentage, like Barbados, what, what percentage do you think uh, is lost yeah. for leak, leaky pipes or et cetera? Okay, well, um, the figures, as you might expect, vary from country to country. So you have some, uh, if you want to uh, look at them, you can go back to that Caribbean, uh, Caribbean study that the IDB do it. They, they've got figures quoted there. Um, but just briefly, I was hesitant to call this one out, um, but Jamaica has a reported figure in some places of 76% of water is, is lost from the system. From their systems. Barbados is um, probably around 40% of water that's lost. There are some, there are some bright spots. Um, Belize, for example, has got a, a figure of around about, I think is about 22, 22%. So there are examples of good practice. And for example, you know, Belize Water Services has been contacted by other water utilities um, to share with them that you know their experience, their experiences. But just generally speaking, levels of non-revenue water, and I won't get into real losses and apparent losses, because the, those percentages I quote are predominantly real losses of water and not apparent losses. Apparent losses are around about two, three percent. But those are very, very serious figures because it means that you're spending money to produce water which you're actually not being paid for. Now, uh, you're also 
spending money, you should be spending money trying to track them down as well and do something about it. So it is a very non revenue levels of non revenue water and it then interventions have been shown. If you intervene, if you do spend money, you get paybacks of five years or so. You recoup your money within a very short space of time. Uh, thank you, Adrian. We have a question. Hong, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Cashman. It's Gwen from um, Institute for Circular Economy Development, Vietnam National University. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I'm sorry, I, I joined a little bit late, so I missed, I think, some very interesting <laughs> part. Yeah, but um, <laughs> I've been working in water resources sector, not specifically on water treatment or wastewater treatments. But um, currently, we also very much interesting on how we solve um, water issue, especially as uh, uh, at the Iceland levels. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have recently worked on um, Kondao Iceland in southern Vietnam. So there is a big uh, demanding on uh, reuse or recycle mm -hmm. water, but also uh, rainwater harvesting in terms of uh, yeah, and we try to put it as um, in, in in term of circular economy uh, approach. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, I just want to ask you if you see uh, there any uh, potential of developing circular economy uh, solution in water sector in both water supply and wastewater as um, at the Iceland scales, and yeah, let's say also um. Uh, yeah, I think that would be also very context specific, but mm -hmm. uh, if there is any recommendation for countries like in Vietnam, but maybe also mm -hmm. in Global South. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a great question, uh, Hong, um, and thank you very much for it. Um, I think, yes, we, we're talking in, we, we're using the, the, the term circular economy. Um, in some ways, you could say it, it's uh, it's the wise use of, of, of water of resources that we have. There are some, I think, emerging some good, some good practices. And I'll give you, uh, I touched briefly on, uh, mm. on one example from here in Barbados. And I think, um, Barbe, I live in Barbados, therefore perhaps I would push this one forward. Um, we've recently got funding from the Green Climate Fund to upgrade our wastewater treatment systems to tertiary level. In the past, that water was uh, it only received primary or secondary treatment, and it went in back into the ocean. This project, though, that is it, it is a circular economy project in in many ways because that treated water is now going to be used to support agriculture. So, in addition to putting in the wastewater treatment systems, we are putting in place infrastructure that will enable agriculture to use that water for irrigation when they use it but when they're not using it in those months that we have high rainfall and you don't really need to supplement then it will be used for managed aquifer recharge as well so making it available for then further abstraction later on later on in the year and i think we that that is on a you know a somewhat larger scale on a Smaller scale, we have a development um, near the airport where there is a, uh, it's a housing development where there is a wastewater treatment system in there, collects water, and that water is then reused for non-potable uses on site. Now, we are also, and this is where I was talking about changes in planning and regulations to support reuse the importance of them. We are changing regulations to encourage the reuse of water for a range of purposes. So we're developing codes and policies, uh, not policies, I, I would say codes and uh, regulations that allow for dual plumbing, that allow for treated wastewater to be used for flushing, for the flushing of toilets, 
um, for example. So that is a, a, a more, we're already doing it, but we're now putting into in place the regulatory environment. So often the message, one of the things messages I would give is that whilst the technology is there, we need to enable the technology we need to integrate it. We need to enable that technology through our planning processes, what we require of planners, and through our regulatory requirements. And that means we need to look at our building codes, our, our standards. We need to train our plumbers. We need to you know, train our architects. We need to train our developers in all of this. So it's not only the technology. It comes back to that governance framework that we need to put in place. We're starting, and I think in, I would hope that Barbados is leading the way uh, in, in showing what can be done. And that with the challenges that we face in the future over changes in population, demographics, changes in, 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 in climate, that these sorts of, this will, um, uh, how can it incentivize and speed up the, the this adaptation uh, uptake. So thanks for a really great question. Yeah, thanks so much. May I just uh, follow up some more one? Please uh, do. From Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Erin, can I, okay, thank you. Yeah, just maybe a small one. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I just think I fully agree with you that the technology is there and we need a lot of, uh, let's say, awareness, trainings, and also regulating things um, at different uh, areas. Uh, but just one more thing related to the technology because uh, clearly we work in the Iceland and people are so very much interested on, on the technology, on uh, uh, on um, uh, um, cheating or uh, say um, uh, changing uh, from seawater to, to fresh water. So do you think about this solution, how this? Yeah, of course, yeah, RO also <laughs> advanced technology, but I think it's still a bit costly, but the people still very much interested in that because, you know, water, the sea water is a lot. So yeah, yes, thank yeah. you so much. Well, we do have, um, we do actually have examples from smaller, mm -hmm. some of our smaller islands of where desalination has been this, put yeah. in place using mm -hmm. solar power. Uh, uh, there are a number of uh, very of the small islands, and when we're talking smaller islands, we're talking of islands with maybe 5,000, 3,000 people on them, um, where traditionally they've rel had to rely on harvesting of rainwater, but we are seeing the effects of climate change, and that is reducing the amount of rainwater that they're receiving, so they're having to adapt uh, and what what is, we've been doing is putting in place smaller solar powered desalination desalination plants but you then have to couple that with you know the the um unlike rainwater harvesting which takes place very much at the household level you then have to facilitate the access to the desalination so it does tend to be a bit more a bit more expensive but with desalination, your biggest cost is usually in the power. And through using, you know, um, solar power, we can tr hopefully eliminate one of the biggest cost aspects of that. So that is there. Uh, and I've worked on a couple of projects. Um, uh, I'm not a particular fan of desalination, but it has its place. And I've worked on a couple of projects for smaller islands where Certainly, I've been looking at that and proposing that as solutions to the issues that they have. Um, but I do think it needs to be looked at, not just desalination and then throw the water away. We need a more holistic approach, a circular approach that you quite rightly have, have highlighted there, where we, that, that very expensive, that expensive water is not then just thrown away, but we look at integrating what reuse within, within that cycle. And I think Islands are a great place that we can um, you, we can look at those sorts of technologies. So yeah, thank you again for that. So Adrian, thank I think so we've run out of time. So <laughs> I think so. <laughs> up, but thank you so much for uh, for talking today. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of housekeeping. Next week is uh, I think it's our tenth week with the seminar series. Uh, Halla Sahali from St. Kitts Nevis will be presenting on nature-based 
approaches for watershed management in the Caribbean. So I thank everyone. Adrian, thank you so much. Uh, and Hal, if you're still on, we have a time change here in Canada. So uh, you are an hour ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It, it makes my life easier, actually. In this <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, cheers.